This is a microjet turbine powered RC car. Yes, that's right, I've just built a land speed record inspired RC car and I've been hard at work developing its control systems, brakes and parachute while trying not to destroy my rather expensive and scary jet engine. Oh no. In this video, you'll see how I went about modifying this Armour Limitless RC car by doing the most extreme engine swap possible. This video was sponsored by Squarespace. So how did I get to a point where I was willing to strap a jet engine on top of a ready-to-run RC car? If you've watched my videos before, you'll know that I'm into rockets and planes and racing cars, so you could probably have guessed I'm also interested in land speed record cars. I haven't quite got the budget to build anything to take to the Bonneville Salt Flats or the Black Rock Desert yet, so I want to build a jet-powered model car to gain some experience in the meantime. So the other day when I was looking at my Armour Limitless, I thought, you know what, why not stick my RC jet engine on the top of it and see what happens. Yeah. I thought it was about time that I put that thing to good use, but hopefully I'd have some more success with this car than with my rocket car that came to a fiery end last year. The goal initially was simply to mess around and get the car to drive along under pure jet power, because I hadn't ever seen that before. So I started on the teardown, starting by removing the body, battery mounts and wings from the RC Limitless car. Alright, I've got the Limitless all stripped down now, so basically what I'm going to do is just mock up where I want the uh, fuel tank and the engine. Those are the two largest components that I'm going to have to deal with on the jet car. I'm also going to remove the drive shafts, the motor, the speed controller and all that kind of stuff because obviously the wheels need to be unpowered so that the turbojet can propel the car without any resistance. The car isn't going to be driven through the wheels, it's going to be powered purely by the jet engine. Meanwhile I could bring the engine out of hibernation and give it a run up to see if it still worked. These things are intended for large scale RC jet planes. This one produces around 120 newtons of thrust at full throttle, which is equivalent to a force of around 12 kilograms. Initially I planned on designing some mounts which would first be 3D printed to check the fit before CNC cutting them from aluminium. However, while I was checking the fit of these 3D printed versions, I thought, you know what, let's just see if they melt first before solving a problem that might not actually exist. To give them just a bit of thermal protection, I wrapped them in aluminium foil which would reflect some of the heat. To install the mount permanently, I drilled several holes in the chassis to bolt the engine mounts down and then I could bolt on the engine. I can now position the ECU and the other electronics for controlling the engine, hook up the radio receiver and install the fuel tank, which is just an off the shelf thing that's used for model aeroplanes. Trust me, the fuel in here will not last long. At this point, the car sort of resembled Richard Noble's very first thrust car, which was similarly just intended to be a learning platform. I'd done the minimum amount of work to get to this point where I could fire up the car and see if it moved. This meant that the car didn't even have any brakes yet. Would I need them though? Well, we'd find out. So for the first test, I filled up the tank with kerosene mixed with a special turbine lubricating oil and took the car out to see if I could get it to move. Okay, it's working now. Still 20,000 RPMs to go until it gets to idle. Okay, that's fully at idle. I expected that the engine would have to throttle up a bit to overcome the static inertia of the 6 kilogram car to get it moving, but I found out quite quickly that I needed to keep my foot in front of it to stop it accelerating away. Even when the engine was just idling, it had enough thrust to accelerate the car. Awesome. It idle, it was wanting to push it along. Yeah, I need some big brakes on it. So, how was I going to build some brakes that could significantly slow the car down from a high speed? All of my other RC cars simply use their onboard motors to electronically slow themselves down. However, my car didn't have a motor as I wanted to keep the car a pure jet car, powered only by the turbine like land speed record jet cars. My real car has disc brakes on the front wheels to slow itself down. This is a type of brake that uses calipers to squeeze pads against the disc to create friction. Initially I thought about building little disc brakes and calipers into the axle hubs of the RC car but then I realised that I could potentially make the job a lot simpler by reconnecting the wheels to the drive shafts that I'd removed earlier. This way I could use a single disc brake on this prop shaft. I started designing some bits and bobs to build this before realising there was actually a product out there that already did this. It just uses a servo to grip onto a disc really hard. So I got this thing through the post and assembled it and then set up the servo so it would softly squeeze its pads onto the disc with more and more force. However, I found a problem which was that it was actually designed for another RC car and wouldn't fit onto mine. But with some drastic action from a rotary tool and a sanding disc, I managed to solve that and it wasn't a problem. Now the disc fitted over the drive shaft cup. It seemed to work quite well. 
I only linked up the prop shaft to the rear wheels, but later I could actually decide to link up the front wheels too, as this RC car is actually four wheel drive. So I'd have to work out what the compromise was and figure out what would work best. Incidentally, I also set up a switch on my transmitter to work like a handbrake so that I could fully engage the servo while the engine was ramping up to idle. Now I had a way of preventing the car from accelerating away. Time for test number two. Let's get this thing fired up. Got my ear protection, very important. Plug in the battery, handbrake engaged. Let's turn this onboard camera on. Guess we'll go for ignition. We're gonna get ready to shut it down in case the brakes can't hold it. Brakes off a little bit. Okay, the brakes seem to work. Okay, let's see if we can get it to steer around a bit. Okay, off the brakes now. Whoa! Right here, the engine is still only at idle, producing only a small percentage of the thrust that it's actually capable of. I wanted to see how well the brakes worked, so I gave the engine some more welly with the handbrake on. However, the high thrust line combined with the sheer power of this jet engine meant that the rear wheels started to scrub along behind at around 10% throttle. So it looks like it's just gonna pull it along with the back wheels locked. But then something quite bad happened. Oh, oh no. So what happened there was a bit weird, but uh, I've worked out that it was actually my fault. I ran out of fuel and uh, the engine died. Big error because that meant that the engine failed to cool itself or start cooling itself with the brushless motor on the front to spin the fan up. Thankfully, I managed to tell the engine to cool itself manually and it wasn't damaged from overheating. To make sure, I put some more fuel in it and then gave it another run. <laughs> shut down, let's shut down. Have you ever seen an RC jet car before? Well, now you have. How cool was that? I knew I'd need some more stopping power at higher speeds, so it was time to start work on the parachute system. I sketched out some ideas for making a spring-loaded ejection system that could be activated by a single servo. Next, I cadded up some parts on my computer and printed them on my Ender 3 3D printers. I glued these parts together and installed a rubber band on the inside that gets stretched when loading a parachute. The idea with this is that the door gets held shut by another band attached to a servo. I wasn't sure if this would work, but... <gasps> Yes, it worked. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'd slightly miscalculated how big this parachute pod needed to be, so the parachute I wanted to use didn't fully fit with its strings attached, which meant I had to start making a version 2, which would include a few other improvements. While this printed though, I cut a slot in the car's rear diffuser for the version 1 device, loaded the parachute the best I could with it sort of sticking out a bit, and then gave it a test to see if this seemed to work at all. Right, before I show you how well the parachute system deployment thing works, it's time for a very quick ad from the sponsor of this week's video. Video, Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Here are four features that you should know about. One, buying a domain from Squarespace is super simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Two, you can sell your products on an online store. Whether you sell physical or digital products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. Three, you can present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs, display projects in customizable galleries, galleries and add password protected pages to share private work with clients. Four, you can make pro level videos with Squarespace's Video Studio. The Video Studio app helps you make and share engaging videos to grow your audience and get people to buy things from your store. So head to Squarespace for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash project air to save 10% off on your first purchase for a website or domain. Thank you very much Squarespace for helping to uh, support my channel. Right, so here's how well the uh, parachutes worked. I drove the car to the far side of the car park, turned around and throttled up a bit, releasing the parachute and braking simultaneously. Yeah, that was pretty pathetic, wasn't it? This was just not enough speed followed by me locking the rear wheels up, trying to slow down. This demonstrated to me that I definitely needed to link up the front wheels to the inboard disc brake. Well, that wasn't quite perfect. You can try that again at least. So I reloaded it and fired up the engine again for another go with more beams. When you're like 20 feet behind it. So that was obviously a lot better despite locking up and spinning out. Time to work on the brakes some more. 
All right, I've now hooked up the brakes to the front differential with the drive shaft because as I mentioned earlier, this RC car is actually originally a 4x4 car, so I had the ability to do that. And I've been outside again to see if it worked. And I'm pleased to say that the brakes now work extremely well. Even when you lock the wheels, it's not going to swing the rear out like it did before. But now I really need to find myself a big old runway or something so I can really put this car through its paces. That's now the limiting factor on this project. So if you own a runway or a racetrack or something like that, or you know someone who does, or you have a contact that might be useful to me, then make sure to comment down below, please. That would really help. I'm looking to get this car up to speed over the next few weeks. So subscribe so you don't miss uh, any of the future content on this car. Um, and in the meantime, maybe watch one of these videos over here, because if you've got to this point in this video, then you're probably going to enjoy these too. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you, uh, I suppose, when I test this car again. Cheers, see you later.